If you live in the Western United States, you already know that Burr Morell season 2021 is almost upon us. So I wanted to give you the heads up about Burr Morell maps from my friends Kristen and Trent Blizzard over at Modern Forager. They take U.S. Forest Service data about wildfires and then pick out the best potential morel burns across almost every state in the Western U.S. You can find the maps at modernforager.com. They will take your burn morel game to the next level. And again, that's modernforager.com for burn morel maps. Hi there. Welcome hey. to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're joined by mycophagy legend, Larry Evans. Larry is a mushroom hunter, a teacher, a cultivator, a songwriter, and a cook. He has been instrumental in organizing forays, festivals, and workshops in Colorado, Montana, Washington, Oregon, British Columbia, Bolivia, and now Jamaica. He is a founder of the Western Montana Mycological Association. He wrote a field guide to the mushrooms of the Amazon, and he has appeared in Ron Mann's infamous comedy documentary, Know Your Mushrooms. His vast body of work includes detailed accounts of burn morel tracking throughout the Western U.S., explorations of jam-packed fungal jungles in Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, and he has evangelized audiences about means of fungal digestion, how fungi remediate contaminated soils, and what the process of mushroom making is all about. I'm excited to laugh and learn and learn a lot about soil carbon today with our real life fungal pioneer. Larry, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, you bet. I recognize that guy vaguely. Yeah. Some of those characters. Yeah. <laughs> some of that's true. <laughs> Indeed. This is a great opportunity to talk to people. It's only powerful and impactful, I think, because we have great guests and with a guest like yourself, there are a million directions we could go, so much we could talk about. You know, I'm sure a lot of people listening are familiar with your work, traveling the world, exploring fungal diversity, especially in jungle regions. I think that's the image of kind of Indiana Jones, mushroom hunter is what I have of you. But, yeah, uh, well, you know, we can, we can touch on Bolivia and all that kind of stuff. But I think the real problems are of a global situation. And that's why I really feel that this soil carbon issue is so central to what we've been talking about. After reading your notes about it and reading some other works like Michael Phillips about basically being smarter about supporting the soil carbon process with ways that aren't groundbreaking, aren't crazy technological, it's really one of the main things that we can do right now to change the planet. That's it. I mean, the thing is too, Soil carbon is something that as soon as people understand it, it's a paradigm shift. As soon as you understand what is really going on and what really has value, your value system changes. You think what is valuable changes, what gives you survival value changes, you know, and you don't really go back and start believing in the old, the old way of thinking after that. Yeah, it's all about shifting the dominant paradigm, and I guess just diving into it at its fundamental level. What is the soil carbon process and why should we care about it? Well, soil carbon is a really long and dubious, sketchy type of a name for, or I should say an oversimplification for a whole massive number of different compounds that are also really reduced carbon is probably the more appropriate descriptor for this because reduced carbon is still tied up with other compounds other carbons other perhaps uh, hydrogens and whatnot and it's not carbon dioxide it's not floating around in the air as oxidized carbon and so in the big picture carbon makes a cycle between the carbon dioxide in the air and the reduced carbon that's in the soil and historically, this has gone through huge changes. If you go back to the 260 million years ago, for example, oxygen was like 30% of the atmosphere. We had giant insects. We had coal seams being laid down. A tremendous amount of carbon is reduced. And yet now we're seeing so much of this reduced carbon, this uh, coal and oil and other things being oxidized into the atmosphere. And as a result, 
we've got this carbon dioxide buildup and it shifted the carbon balance away from the reduced carbon in the soil into the oxidized carbon in the air. Right. So we want all of these ubiquitous organic carbon molecules to be solid, actually in the soil, not floating around in the air. That's like the core of the problem. Right. The longer that we can keep the carbon on the ground, the cooler the planet's going to be, the more moisture we're going to be able to hold. Seriously, that's it in a nutshell. If, yeah. no, if you don't get anything else out of this whole talk, the idea that keeping the carbon, the reduced carbon in the ground instead of putting it back in the air, bury it, don't burn it. That's the essential message. I think that's the key phrase from reading some of this information is bury it, don't burn it. And that leads us right into the actual functional steps of the cycle. So when we're talking about pulling carbon out of the air, putting it in the soil, what are you know the steps in that process? Well, of course, the first step is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is your main, your main way of reducing carbon. And this has been happening for millions of years. It's kind of an interesting story because fungi played a key role in how our atmosphere is made up. I think you mentioned earlier the, that little essay about soil carbon and you, where does coal come from? And basically, during this ancient time period, the trees and the fungi each had reached a balance about 300 million years ago. And for every compound that the trees could create through photosynthesis, there was a fungus or a bacteria that had a single site enzyme that could unlock that chemical compound and get the energy out of it and basically eat it, right? Or digest. Mm -hmm. For example, like cellulose, right? Cellulose is this great thing where you've got sugar molecules hooked uh, nose to tail like a big string, and you can take a single cellulase enzyme and unzip that whole string of cellulose and liberate all that sugar and you can digest all that sugar, yum, yum, yum. That metabolizes great. But the other part of wood is lignin. 260 million years ago, lignin was kind of developed by the cycads and conifers that were uh, around it. And this lignin is what we call rosin. And unlike cellulose, which is this one polymer of the same sugar molecule repeating over a million times it's the opposite lignin is a mess dude i mean <laughs> lignin has got like single ring compounds it's got double ring compounds it's got double bond links it's got single bond links it's got forked link compounds i mean it's like oh man they took everything in the kitchen sink and put one or two of them into this lignin and as a result, it's like glue. It's a mess. You can imagine the dilemma of an organism trying to take this stuff apart. It's like you pull out one enzyme, it burns one molecule, you're done. You get another enzyme, get one more molecule, you're done. It's like it's a black hole. This lignin, there's no way to get enough energy out of that to eat it, right? So it's literally a black hole, and, and this becomes coal. This becomes lignite. This oh, is the reduced carbon that is buried in the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian deposits from 260 to 300 million years ago. And at the end of this period of time, something remarkable happened. Fungi developed the ability to make peroxide enzymes out of the oxygen in the air and the water that was everywhere. It's amazing. Three different routes of evolution. They got the lacase enzyme, got manganese-dependent peroxidase, and we got lignin peroxidase enzymes all out of this. And they're all based on the same idea that the fungus has basically managed to harness hydrogen peroxide or to liberate hydrogen peroxide onto this lignin mess, this glob of 
unformed molecular bondage. And it just burned through it. Suddenly you've got a whole pile of small molecules you can digest, you can metabolize. It was a tipping point. It was a huge change. The oxygen's been less ever since in the air. Okay, so this emergence of white rot fungi, you're kind of explaining those two sides of white rot and brown rot fungi, which generally are either decomposing the cellulose or the lignin. It sounds like the white rot developed a little bit later once they're able to unlock the black hole of carbon that was these lignin materials. And that was my next question. You just hinted at it. it was how does that change this carbon cycle? Because before you had these woody lignin pieces that would end up being buried in the ground and lasting for millions of years, but now they're actually being broken apart and that carbon is being broken down essentially. And the oxygen is being pulled out of the air by the fungi to do just that. So yeah, on the other side of the curve, man, whereas during the, the coal making era, all this stuff was getting laid down because the fungi couldn't break it down. It got buried. Ever since then, the fungi have been able to break this stuff down. We use, seriously, we use the same fungi, the same material that we're talking about for this coal metabolism to break down the petroleum residues when I was working in Ecuador. This is how we, do, we clean up the soil. The same peroxidase enzymes in these mushrooms are the same, like oyster mushrooms are a great example. And these break down the reduced hydrocarbons that are found in soil. And so that's actually pulling out oxygen because these master chemists need that element. They're pulling oxygen out of the atmosphere. And that leads to, it sounds like, a higher concentration of carbon then floating around in the air. It's metabolizing, yes. It's, the idea is when you've got even petroleum, you know, whether you're starting with wood or rosin or petroleum, right. whatever it is, the end game for the fungus is CO2 and water, baby. I mean, it's just like you and me. It's res respiring. Right. You know, metabolizing stuff. The cool thing about fungi is that the environment that they have inhabited for so many millions of years, this soil environment that we're, we've been talking about, this is the probably the biggest ecosystem on earth and we're just barely starting to get a handle on it as you mentioned we're just realizing now the difference between northern and more southern types of forest in terms of how much carbon they sequester you know how many minerals they tie up things like this another huge subject to get into yeah well and let's talk about the actual carbon that gets sequestered in the soil because from what you're breaking down to me my first reaction is well that would mean less carbon in the soil because this carbon is being liberated from things like lignin and being then distributed but how does the actual soil ecosystem function as a carbon sink and then how do fungi and and other you know microorganisms play a role there oh that's a big question small question we'll, yeah we'll try and make a story out of it kind of okay Perfect. If you imagine in our northern Rockies ecosystem, the fungi go through a yearly migration, right? Whereas your elk may go up and down in elevation to follow the vegetation. The fungi go up and down in the soil horizon the same kind of way. Wintertime, the fungi are right at the soil surface. There's an actual subnivian below the snow ecosystem that exist underneath our snow. The little mice and squirrels, they live under there. They eat fungi that are stuck on the snow level. There's a, a large amount of fungal metabolism that's going on under the snow and as the snow melts. Wow. You'll, later in the year, as you're hiking around, you'll see these sudden big white patches, right? You'll see like shot through with mycelia. And you go, what the heck, you know? Yeah. Well, a hotbed of fungal activity in January. You had a water movement in that area. The same type of thing is what I follow when I'm chasing morels. I find the actual haploid form of the morel dumping its spores into uh, flowing water areas in order to expand the surface area that the organism can access. Right. And during the wintertime, you do have the fungus pretty much at the surface of the soil and the snow but when it falls down 
when the spring comes through, you see the snow melt fungi growing around the snow banks, and you can actually find the mycelial fibers right there, like spider webs growing around the melting snow bank. You yeah. come back to places a couple weeks later, and the fungi are not at the surface anymore. You dig down maybe four or six inches, and you can find the white of the metabolizing fungi down at the lower level where the moisture is. Come back in July or August, and you'll be very hard put to find the fungus. You'll have to go down a foot to actually see that same mycelial wow. activity, or you'll have to get inside of one of these big chunks of brown cuboidal rock, one of the nurse logs or one of the trees that has been broken down by the cellulose decomposing fungi, like like your conchs, like mm. a lot of your conchs leave, like your Ganoderma aplanatum, your artis conch, or Vomitopsis panicola, you know, the red belt fungus, even your Ganoderma, organense, or any of your reishi. These all leave brown cuboidal rot type of residue when they're done eating the wood. And that BCR, that brown cuboidal rot, holds five times its weight in water. And that's the key component of our Western soils. Look at your Western soils. It's almost all either brown cuboidal rot or chitin or rock. <laughs> rock doesn't hold water. Brown cuboidal rot holds five times its weight in water. And chitin, again, that's the body of the fungus. The fungus doesn't take the mycelium with it when he goes up and down vertically like this. This fungus is growing new mycelia all the time. It just leaves the old stuff behind. That's the stuff you see of the white patches you'll see at the top of the soil and things like this. Wow. So they're actually shedding. A lot of people know that the chitin is actually the membrane of the mushroom that we all know and love, the big fruit body of the mushroom. Uh, right. It's loaded with chitin. So they're actually shedding that, leaving it behind. That's getting stored in the soil ecosystem, making up the soil. And then this BCR seems to be a really, really central piece of any Western ecosystem. Obviously, you're uh, usually in Montana, Colorado. I'm here in California. So that BCR is actually a key component. And it sounds like it can even help fungus to better survive. I mean, they don't need to go as deep to find moisture, they can kind of center around these BCR patches of soil. Reserves, yeah. Seriously, this is where it all ties into forest management and wildfire management. Because right now, our discussion of wildfire is driven by the firefighting industry. Right. And they use a rhetoric about firefighting that describes all wood and vegetation as fuels. Right. And while they're true, fuels is a very important realization here. Fuels are important because you have a lot of surface area exposed to the air, right? That's what you get when you get a campfire. You want a, lots of little branches that'll burn. But if you take those same branches and you crush them and you pound them into the soil, they hold the water. They hold so much moisture that, again, I can literally go in and find brown cuboidal rot in the middle of the driest season and squeeze you out a shot glass full of water right out wow. of cuboidal rot. And this is exactly what the fungus is doing. This is why, you know, we've been talking about building bunkers, if you will, fungal bunkers, and putting chitin barriers around human habitation around wildfire prone areas. If you're going to do a management thing, chitin doesn't burn first. You can't burn. You can't keep that chitin burned. So as a moisture retention situation, as soil organic residue, that biochar and brown cuboidal rot are the firefighter's friend. These are the ways that you're going to hold soil moisture in the ground and keep your forests intact and providing shade and cooling. That's why it's such a huge part of the solution. Obviously, right now we're witnessing a lot of the Western US be ravaged by wildfires. And actually, one of the bigger things that's happening that I don't see being covered is the Amazon is actually experiencing a massive wildfire season as well. 
that we just had at the end of 2019, the Australian wildfires. So we're all kind of realizing this is becoming more and more of an issue. And I know that people have cited the fuel on the ground, the loose bits of wood on the ground is one of the big drivers of the current forest fires. And it would sound like we need to implement some kind of better understanding of brown cuboidal rot and the actual structure of the soil that helps it retain moisture and prevent these areas from being prone to fire. And to me, it would seem as simple as why aren't there people out there picking up this, you know, spread out wood branches and things and just burying it under the ground? Well, I spent the last 30 or 35 springs of my life inside burn zones. I, right. I go from one burn to another all across the Western U.S. and Canada up to Alaska and California and so forth. And the one thing that I was reminded of by someone who was new in the thing is that when even you walk through and you see that these standing trees have been reduced to almost nothing but biochar, no branches on them. They're just completely blackened all the way up. And yet lying on the ground in the same one step away is a rotten log that could have just been there since 500 years ago. Right. That's a great example of how brown cuboidal rot maintains moisture residue, even in the scorching temperatures of a, of a wildfire. It would seem like fungi are instrumental in creating BCR compounds that are critical to, to what we're talking about. We think, too, that when you burn wood, 40% of that, chemically, 40% of that wood is water, simple yeah. H2O. And that other 60% that you're burning the hydrogen and carbon and all that other stuff to liberate, that 60% of the mass has to generate heat just to vaporize all that water. Right. So out of every 1,000 pounds of wood that's burned 400 pounds of that is water dude that water's going downwind that's not going to it's not hanging here in montana or colorado that's that's blowing east somewhere that's going to go rain in the atlantic ocean or something you want that moisture to stay you want that wood to stay with wow. your ecosystem you wow. want that wood on the ground in bc i mean i'm not going to say that bc has all the answers but their forestry codes have been updated a lot more recently and they mandate that you have to leave behind coarse woody debris that everything has to be in complete contact with the ground any log no logs are suspended or hanging or branches hanging it's on the ground it's flat on the ground and at that point after the first snow that stuff it's moist it's holding moisture that's how our Western ecosystems have survived the fact that our times have been getting drier and drier. Most of the water that we have in our upper elevations of the mountains around Montana and, and Colorado and, and California, it's fossil water. And that fossil water is held in the form of brown cuboidal rot. And like you said, feet thick in some places of chitin and microorganisms and detritus things that we don't have very glorious names for but <laughs> it's where the water is in our very very arid ecosystems the only reason that we have a lot of these forests is because there's enough residual moisture or residual cuboidal rot and stuff in the soil to support the trees and you see so many times i'm sure in california too if you get a burn on the south-facing slope, dude, it's not going to regenerate. It's not right. coming back. It's gone, dude. It's gone. You know? And the same after salvage logging sales. When you take out that shade that the standing dead trees provide, you raise the soil temperature more than five degrees warmer than if you had simply burned it or if you had simply clear-cut it. You know, that combination of removing the cover and then cutting the trees raises the soil temperature and literally kills Geopixis carbonaria, 
the fire following fairy cuts. Geopix, this, this is a critical, just tiny little thing, no bigger than your fingernails, the mushroom comes up. But the organism itself forms relationships with 95% of the trees in an ecosystem. And that 95% relationship, that's the biggest damn organism you ever saw. You go up in Alaska and you can literally see in these isolated areas, you can see where the, the little fire fallen fairy cups outline the area of an entire stand and everything else is under permafrost. But then you see from one end to the other that this single organism is linked up with every single tree in that little island. And it's the size of a whale. It's more, more than a whale. It's huge. The fungus itself is massive. Such important ectomycorrhizal species like that. We know that ectomycorrhizal mushrooms are the ones that are connecting trees, passing food and nutrients, but also mainly water. They're acting like prosthetics, tiny roots to go get these trees more water. I mean, it sounds like having soils with enough of this BCR material is key to help those fungi survive which then in turn helps the entire forest survive. I mean, wood is more valuable being integrated into that ecosystem than it is as fuel. You just expose the inefficiency of it as a, as a burning fuel. I mean, it sounds yeah, more not valuable. Really good, to... Not a good fuel. And, you know, seriously, you got to think, what's a $3.50 two before worth? Right. What's you know? that worth in the forest? Yeah. I mean, is that, is that carbon represented in the forest? Stopping the loss of erosion and, you know, maintaining water in the higher elevations. Let's do the math real quick. As temperatures rise, is that going to favor hot species or is it going to favor cold species? Yeah. The immediate thing is, well, it's going to favor hot, hot species. But no, it's not, dude, because as the temperature increases, it pushes the cool date and the water date further back. So there's no water for the hot species. They're not ever going to get wet. All your summer species and all your favorite uh, low elevation stuff, it's never going to see water again. That's why you've got shaggy manes and all these auto-digesting mushrooms that evolved during the Miocene period, during the longest period of drought that we've seen on the planet. This is what we're looking at in terms of the future. The mushrooms are going to be running towards the snow line. And from what you're laying out here, I mean, there's this huge geologic time scale where these lignin dissolving fungi emerge, thus preventing more carbon from just getting buried and stored as coal because they're actually liberating the carbon from lignin. So it would seem like as we move on that time scale, keeping what carbon does remain as woody material is more and more important. True that. You know, again, that Smithsonian article not too long ago emphasizes this that our northern boreal forests like your conifer ecosystem are a better sequestration of carbon than any other soil type because wow. the mycorrhizal fungi the mushrooms that are tied up to these tree roots are so efficient those enzymes that we just talked about those properties are so damn efficient at taking the minerals out of the material that the stuff they leave behind is virtually pure carbon. There's almost no nitrate, no phosphate, no mineral nutrient left. How big of a carbon sink are we talking? Because obviously, you know, we're talking about retaining moisture and I know they're inexorably linked, but this idea of keeping carbon in the ground versus in the air is also a huge part of this. So how much carbon are we talking is being held in these various soil ecosystems? Okay, you've hit on a really good question. And the answer is, how do you measure it, right? Mm, because right. I'm going to tell you that estimates vary between 10 times and 30 times the amount of carbon in the soil versus the carbon in the atmosphere. Okay. And how can you have such a big difference in that? That's, again, because we're using estimates, we're using models, Imagine a net. Imagine that you've got a net with a one-inch square mesh on that net. 
and you lift that net up and that net is you have the strongest way that you can to pick that net up and it's the maximum strength that you have to pick up that net and you get that estimate you get that measurement well let's take that and you've got half inch mesh and twice a big a net and you've got four times as much energy that you can exert you're going to get a different estimate right so the tools and the methods of analysis play a big part figuring out what what numbers were i mean what scale we're looking at here but no matter how you cut it it's orders of magnitude more carbon in the first six inches of soil than in the atmosphere and I mean, it sounds like we need to move that metric even further. I mean, we need to probably get more toward that 30 times, 40 times to really make sure that we're keeping the environment in homeostasis. I mean, is we've that... Got yeah, we've got room. I think you got the point there exactly because we've got the room to sequester all that carbon that's in the air. It's right. not a problem of how to do it. And we have the tool. The tool is photosynthesis. The question is, how can we create that photosynthesis effectively, hold that the carbon in the soil, and then continue the process, right? We need to incentivize it, man. We need to get, there needs to be an economic positive experience to increase your soil carbon, right? And if you're in an arid environment, increasing your soil carbon, I mean, this is, look at Morocco, look at Northern Africa, look at the Sahel. All of these places, literally, soil carbon is wealth. A man's wealth is judged by the size of his compost pile. <laughs> and so it kind of all puts this huge question then on Larry's shoulders, just because you're lighting up this issue. What are some of the solutions? I mean, what are the things that we can do? Because I think the perspective in me and probably a lot of listeners has just shifted and seeing wood not as a resource for us, but as a resource for the environment. Plants end up being these channelers of pulling carbon out of the sky and then bringing it down to the soil where it can be used by other organisms. And then as best you can, obviously laws of thermodynamics, we're never gonna keep all of it, but keep as much of it as you can within that core of the soil to keep that process going. So then what are the solutions that we can actually implement or what are some ideas that you've had to change this? Well. It starts at the individual level. I mean, if right. you're a land or somebody else, you've got a, a burn pile. Don't burn it. Run over it with your lawnmower. If you I like that. Or, or turn into a chip pile and uh, go throw a garden giant compost or some other mushroom. So that's an individual level. On another level, you start looking at land management practices and how yeah. can we get more carbon in the soil. I'm working with outfit like the Nature Conservancy and doing carbon offsets. We don't really have an economic incentive for putting more carbon in the soil, but it would be in the big picture type of thing. It would really behoove us as a species to have some sort of incentive, some sort of motive for people to put carbon in the soil to yeah. bury it instead of burning it. I think one thing, another paradigm shift we can make right away is to stop using this blasted rhetoric about fuels. Wood is not a fuel, it's a sponge. The role of the wood in the environment characteristically is not as something to burn, it's as something to soak up water and hold water. Pine trees, people go, oh, pine needles burn really good. No, they don't. If you don't have 15 miles an hour of, of wind moving over a pine needle, that pine needle has waxes and sterins in its pine needles, and it will create free radical smoke. These free radicals will tie up all the oxygen, and it will put a fire out. This is exactly what trees have been doing since time immemorial. Trees have been fire amongst themselves for years until you introduce things like the ponderosa pine, to South America, they never ha even had fires down there. There's a lot of ecosystems where the trees themselves manage their soil or make their soil and, and that soil protects them or it gives them water. A good example of this is 
grand fur, the true furs and the subalpine furs that you see in our Western ecosystem. These guys create brown cuboidal rock type of soil underneath them and go to a fur stand by it. It's always kind of boggy down here. It's always kind of moist. Well, wasn't didn't just grow there. It started out as rock. You know, mm. the fur made this thing a bunch intentionally. I mean, it sounds like nature is the superior land manager right now, or trees, tree ecosystems are the superior land manager. And we need to kind of catch up to what they've been doing for millions of years, get our heads wrapped around it. And then right before we were talking, uh, right before the show, and you just said something that just clicked in my mind. You're like, we're paying these people so much. We're paying these firefighters to go and enter life-threatening situations and fight these massive fires when we could shift that and really try to, I mean, in my mind, we could try to pay people to go out and bury wood or make sure wood's in contact with the ground at least and ideally prevent some of the need to have firefighters out there. I mean, we need to get ahead make of this thing. Fireproof, yeah, make fireproof. When you look at a natural ecosystem, you don't see lines you know, that go for hundreds of miles, you see a mosaic, you see little checkerboard patches that go bigger and smaller. And that's all the, the overlapping edges of ancient historical fires. And mm. all these mosaics have the effect of getting high and low concentrations of soil carbon, high wow. and low moisture concentrations in different areas. And those low concentrations, the fire gets put out when it hits the rock. The high concentrations, you have a moisture supply from the runoff of that rock that allows the other trees to, to thrive. So it becomes a, a very personal thing about how do you make this ecosystem realize its, its own potential, you know, because fire is a, a very powerful management tool. I think it's uh, certainly there's a, a role for it. But as I was mentioning, I mentioned to the Dean of Forestry in the University of Montana a few years ago, two thirds, at least of all our biomass never burns, even in a lodgepole stand, even in a fire dependent ecosystem, well over half of the carbon is consumed biologically or remains in the ecosystem. And the Dean looked at me and he, he his brow wrinkled for a minute. He says, Larry, I think it's closer to 80%. Wow. So it's really staying in that ecosystem. It's not even getting turned into carbon floating out in the air. Right. And so thinking that these fire dependent ecosystems are turning all this carbon to the air is a delusion or it's a mistake that affected our earlier forest management stuff. But we know now that the place for any sort of photosynthetic product is underground now this uh, this shifts perspective so much and illuminates these carbon and water dynamics and soil that are really at the heart of every ecosystem and when we talk about climate change and i know it's a contentious issue it's a politicized issue when we talk about climate change it gets a little amorphous and you're not sure you know well how is me burning carbon in my exhaust really bad and we lose some of the grounding on why this is important and we lose some of the bigger picture. And that's what I love about talking about this is, you know, the carbon should not be in the air. It should be in the ground. You just have to remember that principle. And carbon in the ground holds water. That's the other thing. Yeah. The Australians are really up on this. They're years ahead of us in terms of dry land management practices and how to increase soil retention, soil moisture retention. They have even fewer precipitation events than we do. The Australians, like the Western U.S., a lot of Australia depends on the dew, the dew point. People often don't appreciate dew, maybe because we don't get up early enough in the morning. But, right. <laughs> but if you do get up early in the morning and you walk around and you see, even though there hasn't been a drop of rain, you'll see drops falling off of your tin roof. Yeah, You'll see a whole drip line. And trees do this themselves. As the tree grows every year, that tree is putting its branches on top of last year's branches in such a way as to create a V, a funnel, 
of the branches. And if you see a tree, like find a spruce tree, find a conifer, check me out on this, and you see how the branches have developed in a mature tree, go to the, the drip line. And I call it the drip line because it is the drip line right around the edge of where the branches end. And you'll see little tiny crevices, little tiny cracks in the duff or the underlying stuff. These little cracks are where the tree funnels its dew. Mm. Because even in the summertime, even when there's like zero moisture out there, the difference in temperature between at the coldest moment of the day, just before dawn, and that is when the humidity is highest and the cold air is the most, if you will, gravid with moisture. And this is when trees release their moisture. Go out sometime. Check it out. You can see it. You can literally see this phenomena if you're in a place where the humidity is fairly high. But the trees sigh. They open their stroma. They have to do this every day. They open their stroma. They release their biological moisture. And you can see the cloud move through the forest. I mean, it goes from one tree to the other, and each one releases its moisture as near to the time as possible. And then the tree's structure, the conifer tree's structure, is one big rain harvesting machine, one big moisture harvesting machine. And all those little drops, all those condensates, are funneled down to the bottom where those little tiny cracks are, right in the drip line. And down there are where the feeder roots are. And the trees hold feeder, and that's how they drink during the dry times of year when they depend on dew to get their only moisture. I mean, it's one of the most critical things we're dealing with, I think. Like, like I said before, this issue of climate change gets so big, and you think, what can we do about it? You know, how do we change it? Personalize, yeah. And the solution is so simple. We can all do this. I mean, and it's something that I would think you could implement even on institutional levels to say, okay, our land management practices now have to take this whole concept of this whole cycle and of retaining moisture and carbon as kind of our number one priority and structure everything else off that. Now, what has been the reaction? You've been given this these talks. You've been spreading oh this information. What has people's <laughs> reaction been to you bringing, bringing this to them? Paradigm, oh no. Yeah. Well, <laughs> You know, seriously, the hardest thing for people to let go is a slash pile burning. The hardest thing to let go. You'd think, well, this is an obvious thing. You just got to stop burning stuff out outdoors. Stop and burning start your pile burning. of wood, yeah. And it's like, trust me, uh, this is very hard for people to let go of. People love to burn stuff. <laughs> or pyromaniacs. It's in your genes. You know, that it's, it's something we have to deal with. But this tendency to just love to see stuff burn. We really need to manage this a, a, a lot more carefully. I know that at least during the 90s and early part of the 2000s, one of our major uh, reasons for forest fires was burns on private timber management things that got out of hand. Right. It spread into the forest, you know. This kind of stuff happens a lot, and we need to realize that some of these, especially upper elevation areas in Colorado, you see three-story tall burn piles. And it's like, there's tens of thousands of years of sequestered carbon, you know? And if you're going to torch that in an afternoon and let that go in the atmosphere, that carbon could be holding hundreds, thousands and thousands of tons of moisture. If it's gone from that mountaintop, how's it going to how are you going to get that moisture retention ability up on that rocky, rocky mountaintop? It's taken 10,000 years to get that carbon up. Once you remove these things from this cycle, we can't really put it back in. No, it's, it's, it, it is. You're right. It's kind of a one way street. And so it's really, I guess, the next level that we're looking at in terms of solutions is yeah. trophic levels. Okay. You're probably familiar with trophism, like uh, the producer, consumer, predator, parasite. Right, right. 
these different levels because each trophic level concentrates some energy. Well, we're going to take that concept of trophism and we're going to put it, we're going to make it much bigger and more complicated. We're going to use insects and fungi and wood. So mm -hmm. wood is our substrate. And let's figure that a fresh piece of wood has a trophic level of 10. And that by the time you're done with it, if you burn it right away to carbon dioxide and water, that's a, a trophic level of zero. So we can get three, four, even six species. And we can insert six trophic levels between that fresh wood and actually turning it into biochar. We can go out there. We can grow shiitake. That, that would grow an oyster mushroom. Separately, we can grow Ganoderma and make ourselves a brown cuboidal rot. We can take those and then make a soil amendment or a horticultural mix that will eliminate our addiction to sphagnum and perlite or grow ops and things like this. You've got brown cuboidal rot that holds five to eight times its weight in water. How much does sphagnum hold? Nah, nah. Never mind. But you see where we're going with this, right? Yeah, each, yeah. Each step in this trophic process yields us a product, and the result leads us another substrate that we can grow Nelson. We can grow black soldier fly larva on your wet compost. We can take that same wet compost and add it to your uh, Stropharia rugosa annulata, your, your garden giant cultivation mix. What we're doing in Missoula right now, we're growing oyster mushrooms. Got a great guy who's uh, got an outfit called Mother Fungus, and he's <laughs> growing oyster mushrooms, right? We get the bricks from him, the spent bricks, after he's got a couple fruits off of them. We take those bricks and we stack them with particle board. Particle board is a, like a toxic waste. It goes into the landfill right now. And it, the reason particle board and this kind of stuff is toxic is because the, the rosin that holds them together is urea formaldehyde, Ugh. right? And urea formaldehyde just doesn't even sound good, does it? No. That's the reason that you get formaldehyde outgassing in some new structures and, and particle board type of stuff. We can take this stuff and feed it to the oyster mushroom that the oyster mushroom goes, dude, there's urea in here. That's gold. We love this stuff. A little bit of formaldehyde, no problem. We've got proxies enzymes. We can burn that stuff off. And so we can take this stuff that has been going into landfill and creating a toxic runoff because, of course, urea formaldehyde breaks down. Your formaldehyde is in the water. It's water-soluble. And then suddenly you have a, a toxic water problem. Formaldehyde is going to get broken away. The oyster mushroom is going to get to eat that urea that it loves so much. And we'll have a high nitrate soil amendment that comes out of this instead of a toxic waste. So the metabolism <clears throat> of this material is far more valuable than burning it. I guess, why don't you define biochar for us? Biochar is like if your uh, brown cuboidal rot is like step three in right. your trophy level on the way down, then biochar is like number one. It's the lowest level. And also biochar lasts the longest. So as a soil component, biochar is really cool because it is an electron sponge. Oh, okay. And in this way, it's really cool because it's the opposite of the fungus. The fungal hyphae, the fungal mycelia are highly electronegative. That's why we can use fungi to remediate heavy metal contamination in waters right we've been doing this quite a bit and it works fine all your cations adsorb they stick to the fungal mycelia and some fungi transport this puffballs and agaricus bioaccumulate heavy metals at like 10 to 100 times the background level but we can take this property of the fungus highly electronegative outside part of it and use it as a filter. We can literally grow these mushrooms to fill a culvert and then run the mining waste through the culvert and there's no heavy metals come out the other side. This property, the fungus, 
which is basically a proton acceptor, right? Getting the cations, the plus factor. Yep. You get the biochar, and it's an electron sink. Between these two, you've got a soil ecosystem. You've got the two ends of the battery that are going to drive your soil ecology. Yeah, and a sustainable remediator. And that I'm just in awe of this idea of metabolized wood has so many uses for cultivation, remediation, then further cultivation as you work down the trophic levels. You can't help but hope that economically somehow we catch on to this and start to realize how much more valuable it is for wood to be metabolized in the environment rather than just burned. You've hit the nail on the head, man. That that really is, again, that's the key point of all this is that we're losing steps in the trophic ladder, if you will, by burning it. You're burning up all 10 steps of the level and you could be getting four or five commercial item, that same pile of sawdust. You know, I love a good wood fire and I was reading some of your information and you're like, stop the burning. And part of me is like those guys were talking about with their giant brush fires. I'm thinking, don't take my wood burn fire away, but it's just so obvious. It's staring us right in the face. It's personal, dude. We all feel yeah. that, you know, everybody yeah. feels. But we need to kind of advance past that and it just realize how how much of an attainable solution this can be to address all these different environmental issues that are now directly affecting us. I mean, now this problem has come home to roost when you see all of these wildfires ravaging the Western United States. We kind of painted ourselves in a corner and um, we're still holding half a can of paint. And the thing is, you know, seriously, this is such a tremendous opportunity. Right. For pe- this is the new the new frontier right now is not some sort of fossil fuel-based fantasy. The new frontier is creating protein from garbage. You know, the real new frontier is making clothing and and uh, building materials out of your waste stream. Yeah. You know, what we're doing in Missoula right now is really exciting. The city of Missoula is granting us room to do this particle board project I described to you because they have a volume of particle board waste that comes through and this allows them to move that waste stream into the mainstream basically into the main composting facility i mean every single one of these is a new potential job a new potential industry i i love the idea of women growing daldinia concentrica the carbon balls you know the cramp balls because i think an industry like that that empowers local people to grow, you know, a remedy for something as ubiquitous and mundane as monthly cramps that doesn't involve any sort of eating anything or, you know, it's just simply a, an age old means of stopping muscle cramps. You know, the medicine bag. I'm sure you've heard of medicine bags. People wearing a medicine belt or a medicine bag around their middle. Sure. Daldinia concentrica. That's what was in the medicine bag. You know? Really? Okay, so I kind of acted like I knew what you were talking about. So Galidia concentria is a type of fungus that was used to actually stop cramps. Yes, it's it's also called King Alfred's Cakes. I got a song about it. Here we go. Daldinia concentrica, King Alfred's Cakes. This is the cure for your muscle aches. You don't boil them or grind them or eat them on down. You just put them in your pocket and carry them around. Well, I don't know much about old King Alfred. He wasn't a history maker. But judging by the cakes he left, he sure wasn't much of a baker. Yes, and we're giving just a flavor of your long and illustrious musical career when it comes to fungi. I'm sure people listening already know about your albums, and you're one of the only people that's made really awesome, fun music about mushrooms. You know, it's part of this future, I think we're all seeing that fungi make possible. They give us this way of like bioengineering our environment, which actually adds value along every step of the way where you're able to take materials that are otherwise worthless and turn them into something else. Almost nothing else that we know of can do it as quickly as fungi can. So true. 
And I think it's the reason it inspires so much hope in people. You know, people like myself, I'm symptomatic of this wave of people that are kind of getting turned on to the, the remediative potential of fungi, but also the generative potential of fungi that's out there. And at like this fundamental base level, having an understanding of carbon and water cycles in the soil just goes hand in hand with understanding on how then those constituent elements birthed out of that metabolism process in the soil can lead to more successful uses and novel uses of fungi. It really goes together beautifully. And the solutions are simple and they're right here. You know, seriously, when you look at protein production, you know, we don't have a big deal about this in the States, but protein availability is a key factor in a lot of the developing world. The fact that we can take existing agricultural waste and grow oyster mushrooms, which have all nine essential amino acids, this is a breakthrough for world nutrition. This is a game changer. Instead of slash burning the forest, to raise a darn cow because you just don't know any better. Right. You just haven't had any education and the only thing that you can sell is meat. If instead you've got the basic information that you've got a complete protein that you can grow here on not even a tenth of the resources required to raise a cow. These types of opportunities are just not available. People, I mean, this simple educational idea that you could grow an oyster mushroom, eat the oyster mushroom, take the spawn, and use that spawn to filter your sewage issue, and then take that sewage issue and grow a garden giant on that, et cetera, et cetera. It's part of a new paradigm. It's part of a new understanding of the, the great, as they say, the great chain of being that recognizes things as parts of a continuous whole rather than to try and break out each individual thing as an identity that doesn't have any context, that doesn't have any relationship to all the other things around it. Now, as we embrace a more holistic biology and holistic understanding of fungi, we're always that missing piece, it seems like. And now that we're really starting to appreciate the extremely multifaceted solution set that's possible with fungi and not just from the mushrooms, as you've elucidated so beautifully. The insects, that's the whole thing. Everybody says, oh, wait, so that's great. So you grew these oyster mushrooms on this contaminated soil. And that's all way cool. Now, who's going to eat those mushrooms? Who's going to eat, right? Who always eats the mushrooms? It's the bugs. The two-legged, we don't even get 1%, dude. You know, <laughs> for instance, ah, there are many morels that will never feel the night. We're pretty, pretty lame when it comes to mushroom harvesting, even though we may look like a pack of locusts uh, when we go through a chanterelle patch or something. Historically, humans have virtually no impact on fungal populations, but boy, insects do. And <laughs> look what insects feed is every kind of bird and every kind of salamander and everything else. So, I mean, you're, you're talking, uh, you know, again, you're talking the whole food chain here when we talk trophic levels. Yeah, and that's really, what, I guess, what the biggest key is, is we're starting high up on the trophic chain here, and you're able to make some of those big changes that are really required right now. Yeah, and seriously, what's going to be more important than clean water? And how many times can you grow a filter? We need to be able to move into flood zones and damage zones and get clean water for large numbers of people immediately. How are you going to do that? You're going to grow a bunch of mushrooms is what you're going to do and run your water through uh, mushroom filters because you can do that in a matter of days or hours on a scale that you can get pure water for all these people. In terms of debris management, I mean, look at after a hurricane, look at after a fire, you've got all these debris issues. Well, there's a, a huge fugoculture opportunity there, you know. Right. The deep horizon spill, we're looking at ways to deal with, we had 2,000 miles of boom. We had 2,000 miles of, of hydrocarbon contaminated boom, and it went in a landfill. It oh. went in a landfill. We had a program lined up where you can take, basically take a big swimming pool and run and fill that swimming pool with oyster mushroom spawn and pull 
those oil soaked booms through that and clean them at a very reliable rate every day because the oyster mushrooms would eat everything off. Right. Oil would be completely devoured and you just no shortage of oyster mushroom spawn. This is the problem. Like anything else, mushrooms can eat toxins, tremendous stuff, especially the, the conks, but only at certain concentration levels, right? Mm. But you just don't throw your oyster mushroom onto the oil pool and expect it to eat it up. You've got to take that oyster mushroom and expand it so many times that your ratio of oil to uh, sawdust is like one to 20. Just this obvious solution, and it makes you scratch your head and wonder how soon will mainstream technology firms and biotechnology firms catch up to this understanding, this resource, this living resource that lies right in front of us. And obviously certain species like oysters stand out as perfect starting points to really explore some of these opportunities. Do you see that on the horizon? I know all of us have, or many people have probably heard of the Myco Renewal Project there in Ecuador. Obviously there are people out there familiar with Paul Stamets' work and doing these experiments. When do you think we get large scale adoption? Uh, when do you think this really becomes the mainstream? This is it. Our, our economic system is not doing the right thing by us at the moment. And as long as that happens, you are not going to be able to expect to generate money in a standard model. But on the other right. hand, you grow a hell of a lot of mushrooms and those mushrooms have a value. And I just can't imagine there are a lot of materials cheaper when it comes down to it than mycelium when you talk about a filter because they are so incredibly efficient and they want to grow exponentially. Mycologists are going to own waste management and whoever yeah. figures it out first is going to be very happy. You know, our waste management industry right now is all about hold your nose and hide it. <laughs> and the thing is that we've got a tremendous potential here to use what's going away as a waste stream now and turning that into all these 10, 12 different trophic levels of products. I think all of us who hear this kind of information want to run out and become mycologists in some way. The beauty is, you know, the citizen science movement, the citizen mycology movement, if you will, community mycology movement is growing such that you can take part in this. And, and those groups are ending up having an impact just because we need more people doing more of this kind of work. Yeah, I have to say that right now we have we have these fictions, these human fictions. One of them is money. Another one is property. Property, you can only own what you understand. Wow. Nobody can. Nobody can own something if they, you know, people bring me stuff all the time that they own, but they don't know if they want it or not because they don't know what the heck it is. It's a mushroom. And it's like, I own this, but if it's not valuable, I don't own it. We got this issue with what? <laughs> a malleable fiction based on another fiction, which is our economic model. Great. The money thing. Yeah. And so right now, this human fiction of money can't be used to buy the human fiction of an illegal substance, which is psilocybin. And that kind of brings us into the next aspect, the next project I've been working on, which was in Jamaica, where psilocybin is legal. And we just did the beta tests this February, right ahead of the whole corona shutdown. And we found out that, you know, people's interest in psilocybin, it, it doesn't look good for a pharmaceutical model. Really want to buy psilocybin every day. They don't want to always have a little psilocybin hanging out. The value of it becomes greater the less you take of it. And we also found that certain threshold doses seem to have a much more beneficial, therapeutic, whatever you want to say, effect than smaller doses. And oh, okay. that was very interesting to me. I think you're probably familiar with the phenomena that we call the big laugh. And the big laugh is when you get a an heroic dose or even less than that, you laugh. Your 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 first response when the mushrooms hit is you're you're holding your sides and howling for 10, 15 minutes usually. And 
we found that with naive people, two grams was sufficient for the big laugh. Mm -hmm. And also that with the big laugh, the therapeutic benefit of the mushrooms seemed to be tightly related to this big laugh phenomenon. It almost fits into this applied mycology model in its own sort of way. And obviously we're not advocating psychedelic use outside of any responsible environment or anything, but it's this idea that not only can we apply knowledge of fungi and this idea of trophic levels, fungal roles in them and uses within them, but we can also apply it to humans directly. And so many people listening know about entheogens and these effects, but it fits right into this model of we're using fungi to remediate so many modern day ills, right? And how does value translate? You know, does a pound sterling and a euro and a dollar, do they really represent value? I mean, I would maintain, and this is a, a thing the World Bank has been studying for quite some time now, is a lot of value. Over half of the value that drives our economic, our global economic system, over half that value is not and cannot be monetized over half over half the drivers half the motives half the stuff over half of that they they're estimating 60 plus percent mm. over half of that energy can't be bought can't Mon be monetized in Money's any way not the answer well it shows the shortcomings of our current economic system is right. that we don't have a way to monetize that value. And that to me speaks to the whole issue of being able to create a value system that is larger than legal currency, larger than government oversight, yeah. and universal in that it's equally valuable in the UK, the US, or China. Part of that value is mental health, my friend. Look what mental health is costing us as individuals and as a nation. I mean, it's it's a huge expense. And that non-monetized value, all those unhappy vets, all those depressed housewives, all those confused kids, all those spaced out old timers, all yeah. those non-monetized values that we have a better way of bringing and making this economic. We don't need to make it dollars. We can make it hours. We can make your time worth something. Well, that's really the only currency you have, right? Is your time and attention. How really. can you be a millionaire? Dude, you've only got 50,000 hours in your whole life. What? <laughs> <laughs> and these things like human health and then ecosystem services and ecosystem health. If our system you know, if money isn't encompassing these, then clearly that's not the end all be all of this big word value. And you've just hit on a huge concept that I think is required. And I think we're connecting some things here because I think people who undergo the psychedelic experience have experiences with psilocybin are much more ready to kind of bounce out of that monetary based value system, quote unquote, and understand that, yes, there is a value system much higher than that. And they get the shift of perspective and I think we're all kind of figuring out what that looks like and how to navigate a value system with each other, this economy. I hear people talk about it more and more now, an economy of time and an economy of attention. And, you know, we're all starting to realize that the solutions lie outside of a monetary system and probably lie outside of a government or a corporation. And there's, there's some other extant unifying thing that we're all going to have to tap into here if we're going to start really shifting the the paradigm it's true and you've you've hit it on the nose because you look at different cultures have very different expressions in this way for example in japan you don't have a nursing home industry there's no nursing home inconceivable how the heck could you have in america with nursing homes and yet the reason is that the oldest son in the house and his obligations to tend to the parents until they pass away. There's no room in that culture for a nursing home. There's no way to monetize that obligation of filial responsibility, for example. And this, I think, is the same thing, too. If you put in time, 
and you can expect to get time back, that matters for daycare. That matters for senior care. That matters because you can't necessarily watch your grandpa all the time. You can't necessarily watch your kid when you're working. If you've got an exchange system that doesn't include money, how cool is that? And we've got the we got the accountant right here. We're carrying it around in our pocket every day. It's a phone, man. It's the same thing with uh, we're talking about free agency for teachers. I think this is the next step. This is the whole teacher crisis we're looking at. Teaching should be an app, man. You should have an app on your phone. You get your personal history. You get your personal experience so that you're teaching chemistry and and not the algebra. And you've got the transcripts, the all important transcripts that says. Yeah, you know, this dude actually does understand calculus. There's actually four teachers who agree that the dude understands calculus. In the 20th century, you had to have a secretary. You had to have a file clerk. No, dude, it's all in your phone. The teacher can teach and then spend half an hour doing the paperwork as well. You know, teaching should be like any other job. You should you should be able to have your own integrity. You shouldn't depend on some school board of people who may or may not agree with you or your students views telling you what you can and can't carry on with in a classroom or how you can spend your time i mean free agency for teachers is the next the next logical step we have the technology to do this and it's a beautiful example and i think this is happening as humans our lifespans are short, so we don't always see that change is possible over this bigger spectrum. We don't see the the gradient. I think we're at just the beginning of this gradient where we're having to integrate new understandings about nature and natural cycles, especially this insight, at least in the Western world, about fungi and the role it has is really one of the earth shattering things that's changing how we see everything. And I think we're integrating knowledge like that. We're integrating new technology and updating the forms of social organization, the cultural values and the way that we organize as humans is changing. And I think you just hinted at a really powerful example of that. And you can see it scan out in so many different directions. The way that human society is gonna change based on our new knowledge and understanding of natural systems, the new technologies we have at our disposal. And that's the one thing I keep telling myself to keep hope right now is that the reason things seem like we're at such a crazy, dire moment is it's kind of right before this jump point where we start to change and we start to to actually change, not just a change of person in some political office, which can be really important in the short term. But we're, we're talking about much bigger changes that I think are going to take place before too long. Agreed. And one of the big things that we've been dra- one big thing that we've been dragging along for a long time is this current unlimited growth model of an economic system. We inherited this corporate model of an economy, you know, from the, this is something we inherited from the days of Kings and sailing ships, man. This is pirates, right? The whole idea of corporations is based on privateers, piracy, basically. That if you can steal it from the Spanish, you can spend it here. If you steal it from the English, your money is no good, bud. This has ruled our entire democratic economic system. This is why Putin can run his oligarchs the way he can. You know, it's the same thing. Hey, dude, as long as you steal, you can spend it here, but you just can't steal from here. The underpinnings of it, not only do they come from unsavory origins, but some of the biggest kind of intellectual luminaries that propagate the ideas aren't necessarily the people that you'd have the most faith in to do a lot of things. And not that I'm necessarily all on board with a government centralized communism either, but this there's this time we're at this jump point where we've got all these new inputs and we're just figuring out how they can be applied. And I think that's going to cause a whole new direction. And, you know, no, kids, you- I, I think we got a new direction, you know, not to use the tired old term natural law, but when you look at ecosystem dynamics, and when you look at economics, they're really both the same thing. Both ecosystem dynamics, you know, all the levels, the trophic levels we've been talking about, all these types of myriads of organisms, thousands of organisms, and economics, which is all about one single organism, human beings, both of those are the study of how energy moves through a system. Yes. 
both ecosystem dynamics and economics are measuring the same thing. The difference is with ecosystem dynamics, you've got multivariable equations. You've got huge levels of complexity that simply don't exist in our modern economic system, which is open-ended. We're never going to run out of resources. And we're always going to have enough fresh air and we're always going to have lots of demand and really fantastic assumptions, right? It would seem like the investment in time would be much better spent understanding this multivariate, extremely complex ecosystem rather than wasting our time understanding this man-made economic system that is not extant. I mean, that could go away and all that yeah. understanding would go would go right out the window in terms of its yeah, value. Due, yeah, with all due respect, it's a human fiction. Absolutely. Uh, ecosystem dynamics and boy, it's a mess. It's a it's algorithm after algorithm after algorithm and you just start wading in. You know, having kind of had this insight thrown at me from so many different angles, and a lot of people have this, where people are getting these realizations you're laying out, and you get frustrated, and you want to oppose something. And what I love about working with fungi and work from people like yourself who examine actual ecosystem patterns that matter and aren't dependent on man-made fictions is you get some tangible tool to actually drive toward a solution. Right. You've got direction. The I think that's one of the most liberating things. You a direction, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, we've talked about some pretty huge concepts, and I know we've hinted a little bit, but what is up next for you, you know, when you're not trying to solve these massive complex problems and thinking about that and doing retreats in Jamaica? I mean, what what's next on your kind of future trajectory? You know, we all we all favor this forward trajectory, we all want to believe in evolution. We all want to believe that these massive changes are happening. But again, like any natural selective process, every single step has to be an improvement or people don't buy into it. And so the big thing that I see is a way to get a system, to create a system where you have this credibility, this trust that you can maintain. How do you get from point A to point B? I think again, incrementally, a little bit at a time. The thing that we're doing in Missoula, we're looking to try and close that carbon cycle, close the carbon loop, you know, Amory Lovins, the downshift, I believe is the name of their outfit. The same type of thing. How do you how do you reorient your lifestyle and how do you make good decisions that are going to save resources, going to save the society? How do you think smarter? Our real challenge here is getting a valid communication system, getting a valid means where we, we can express ourselves with confidence. Right now, I don't have any faith in that the World Wide Web. That there's just as much bogus crap out there as there is decent information. Right. Yep. It takes more time to sort it out than it does to go and find a 20th century book and open it up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we kind of out fancied ourselves. You know what I mean? We weren't ready for this level of technology. We weren't evolved enough kind of morally and with our own discernment to be able to handle this kind of information pouring at us. We've got an operator controlled system, right? You're on an operator controlled system. I'm on an operator controlled system. If we get out of the line, the operator will put the program back online. Nature is not a, an operator controlled system. God doesn't come down and fix things every couple of weeks, you know? Uh, nature is a self-adjusting, self-balancing system. And if we're ever going to deal with artificial intelligence and the potential of that, you're not going to do that with a, a reset system. This child like to think that you would get it with a reset system. you got to have a self-equilibrating system. Systems have to be self-balancing. We didn't get here through hundreds of millions of years of evolution by having a system that didn't balance itself. Yeah. It's obviously working still, despite our best despite efforts. Despite our best, <laughs> our best <laughs> efforts. <laughs> well, I think what's exciting is we have a lot of tools to actually reach that goal. And like I said, I think a big part of the the frustration and the head trip for a lot of people, including myself, is, man, why aren't we already doing this? Like, well, 
Unfortunately, it takes time and it might take generations to really maximize all the beautiful futures Larry's laying out. Maybe, maybe not. You know, seriously, man, as soon as we get our brains off this thing that we have to fight fire during fire season and just start thinking, well, we got to fight fire 365. You know, we just got three quarters more, I mean, three times as much more resources at our disposal. You know, it's human fictions that limit our behavior. It's it's our own, I hate to say stupidity, it's our own prejudice and it's our own unwillingness to break out of our habitual means of transportation, communication. We've got an amazing system here where we used to have just point-to-point communication. I talk, you listen. You talk, I listen, point-to-point, okay? Mm-hmm. Then we got point-to-field. I broadcast to my all my audience. My audience comes into my church or my science hall and I communicate to them and they mumble among themselves and some of them believe me and some of them think I'm full of crap at the end of the day there is some sort of feedback but that's point to feel and then you have what you've just developed now is field to field where in real time I get the news I get the feedback I get somebody calling bullshit, and I get the remediation the clarification this is field to field you're exchanging ideas across a group, a forum, we have achieved a new degree of communication, a new level of sophistication, but we're we're living in the 20th century. We're still thinking about point to point type of communications. I mean, there are people out there using point to field and field to field communication to make millions in business and communications industries. But how many people are thinking far enough out to be able to be planning ahead, to be looking at, a, at communicating within a larger context and creating things like this. It's a huge potential. And again, what we call laws, what we call expectations, what we call religions, what we call values, non-monetized values, all these things are, are limiting us, are shaping us in ways that we don't even understand. We don't even appreciate. Our language, our language doesn't even show us our blind spots our right. language creates our blind spots so learning another language seeing another culture ah totally change your perspective well and you've certainly had plenty of those kinds of experiences to change your perspective so we didn't talk about it on this show but i mean there's few people that have traveled to as many disparate places as far afield as you have in search of fungi and i'm sure that that has enhanced your own perspective and brought you clarity on what is really important and brought you into relationship with something that's above kind of all the cultural fictions that that kind of stunt us in ways. Well put, well put. It's humbling. Hugely enlightening and inspiring, Larry. Uh, I have to ask for all the people listening who want to know more and want to take this kind of deep dive and are probably now going to all want to flock and hear you speak about the future, about fungi and everything else. What is the, where's the best place where people can find you and your work? I would say right now I'm getting less onto the Facebook platform. I've got a YouTube channel, Fun Gal, Jun Gal. That is the YouTube channel. And, of course, I I have email, fungus at fungaljungal.org. And we'll link all of that up in the notes as well as sure. your entry there with uh, Montana – Mycological Association and your website and all that good stuff so people can find you. And I got to say, you know, if people do have the chance to hear you speak, do have the chance to go to a foray or a mushroom event that you're involved in, you know, once we're at the era of events again, take that opportunity because it was actually an early hunt, an early mushroom hunt with yourself, Dan Winkler, Ken Litchfield, and David Gardella that really sent me down the path of being obsessed with mushrooms. So you'll I guarantee if people take that, have that opportunity and they take it, they will enhance their fungal knowledge and become pretty singularly obsessed with fungus and mushrooms. Well, you know, it's great. We we have a cultural blind spot here in the States, more than a lot of countries. And if we just increased our appreciation of fungi to the same place that you see in Europe or Russia or Asia, we're talking, well, one estimate was that you'd have about a $70 billion 
industry Whew. that would be birthed here. And that's just if we assumed that we we're going to eat as many types of mushrooms as they do in Europe. And it sounds like we may even come to a place where we break out of economic systems entirely and invent whole new ways of living on this planet in these human suits. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, what's a mushroom worth? That's a good thing to ask yourself. What's a mushroom worth? Yeah, well, to get at the heart of those kind of questions, I have three final questions I like to ask all my guests. And I know we've kind of touched on all of these, but the first one I love because I've gotten so many amazing new mushrooms out of this what is a <laughs> what is a mushroom that you love and why and this doesn't have to be a favorite it can be any mushroom at all just a crazy one one that you love to look at but what's a mushroom you love and why well i love i love uh that's like asking what's your favorite child but i i do i think it's a good time to bring a little bit of a spotlight on daldinia concentrica because i did mention that earlier it's yeah. a mushroom love with for a long time i even wrote a song to it and i feel that it's a really important pivotal thing because it's a very efficacious medicine i mean here's the most unlikely thing of all is that this mushroom is throwing a few microscopic spore dusts onto your skin and that's somehow stopping a muscle convulsion it just seems too fantastic to believe but Insane, once you've yeah. experienced it you have to realize well Okay, it's obviously working. And this is a mushroom that kind of represents a paradigm change, if you will. A perfect illustration of a lot of the concepts that we've been talking about. And that's definitely a new one for me. So I love that answer. And then another big general question, what is a relationship with mushrooms and fungi given to you? We didn't really get into the story of how you fell in love with mushrooms, but what has that relationship given to you and brought to your life? I think for me, probably the watershed moment or the change, the thing that really changed my relationship with mushrooms was understanding that mushrooms and fungi are two different things. Mm -hmm. That the fungi that are the most diverse organism on the planet are the mycelia they are the fibers the little hydrogen peroxide bleached hyphae that saturate the soil and constitute such a huge chunk of the soil carbon but the mushroom mushrooms only come from maybe five percent of fungal species only a small number of fungi produce a mushroom Right. Most of their respective structures are tiny, invisible things. And so to realize that the mushroom, the reproductive thing, is what most people identify with, and that this is something that lasts for weeks and seems kind of unimportant and feeds insects or stuff like that, as opposed to the fungus, which lasts for centuries and weighs tons and expresses itself once a year maybe right i think that 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 fundamental difference was kind of a, a pivotal moment for me to realize that the fungus was such a huge thing and my vast understanding of my mushrooms was just a little tiny piece of that <laughs> it's one of those perspective shifts that you can't ever go back from the world suddenly looks a lot different when you when you have that realization it's key. It's key. And everybody has to take their own path. But uh, I think that increasingly, we will realize that we have to confront our inner Prometheus and our tendency to take all 10 trophic levels as our own and uh, try to find out how to live in between the wood and the fire. Live between the wood and the fire. I love it. You've been throwing out powerful phrases that I'm going to start stealing as my own throughout this whole, this whole podcast. And then the final question, no, the final <laughs> question is just what is the lasting impact you hope to make with your work? Again, we've nibbled around the edges, but what's that big lasting impact or change you hope to make through your work? No, uh, just a paradigm change. Yeah. yeah just same, something, just a little paradigm change. Yeah. Just a paradigm change. 
<laughs> well, Larry, thank you so much. You know, we could have talked for hours and I would love to have you back on to talk about your trips around the world, get into some more of these ideas of really what kind of future we're looking at as humanity, because I'm fascinated with that, as I think most people are. But thank you for making the time and, and coming and being so present and having such a good conversation with us. I really appreciate yeah. it. Pleasure. Yeah, I'm glad for the opportunity. And and again, you know, I hope that it allows us to gain a more integrated audience, I guess, if you will. Because I think you've got a great audience here. You've got a, a lot of appeal in that you're able to bring people into this discussion to have a way to try and bring, what would you say, bring a focus to uh, this interest that people have in mycology. I think this is a real key role, and I'm glad to see you uh, stepping up there.